from using what's called. Oh, letting out the water. oh, we gotta respond oh, to that in a little while. Well, the Western Rivers call for food. Carbon dating. When it comes with radiometric dating for carbon dating, carbon 14, um, the way it works is in the upper atmosphere, we have solar rays that bombard our upper atmosphere that interact with nitrogen that's up in the upper atmosphere. What it does is it takes a nitrogen molecule and turns it into it turns it into <laughs> carbon 14, which is actually an unstable isotope of carbon. Regular carbon is carbon 12, so it turns nitrogen in our upper atmosphere into carbon 14. Over time, that carbon 14 wants to spit out that extra proton and become regular, back stable, normal carbon. So what happens is that happens through a process called beta decay. It's a radioactive process, so it's an unstable thing. It's almost almost like you have too many people squeezed into a VW bus, you know. You have one too many people in there. Eventually, those guys are going to get kind of antsy and say, we need to make some room and kick somebody out. That's kind of what these atoms do. Now, that carbon-14, though, is produced in our upper atmosphere. It falls down to the earth. It goes into the soil. The plants take up that carbon-14. And, of course, the plants are taking that up. It becomes the building blocks of plants. And then animals eat plants, and we eat plants, and we also eat animals. It also becomes the building blocks of us. So we are what we call carbon-based life forms, right? So pretty much all life is carbon-based. We make the building blocks of who we are based upon carbon. So we take in regular carbon-12. We also take in some carbon-14. Now, we have a pretty steady supply of that. As long as we're eating food, we have a steady supply of carbon-12, a steady ratio of carbon-12 and carbon-14. But when we die, we stop taking in new carbon, right? So that carbon, that's carbon-14, unstable isotope, eventually it wants to kick out those protons like we talked about and it becomes stable back to, to uh, nitrogen. So the carbon-12, the regular amount, and the carbon-14, eventually the carbon-14 depletes, okay? And eventually it turns back into nitrogen. We still have your regular carbon of carbon-12, but your carbon-14 goes away. Now, the speed at which it goes away is what we call decay, decay rate. And so the carbon decays and turns into nitrogen and the, the process or the speed for that to take place is what we call a half-life. So a half-life is determined by if you were to start off with for example one pound of carbon-14 given half of this time for it to decay back <coughs> into nitrogen that's what we call a half-life and the half-life for carbon-14 decay is 5,730 years. So to make that simple what that means is if you had a, a pound of carbon-14 in 5,730 years, you would only have half a pound. 5,730 years, you would only have a quarter pound. And it goes every 5,730 years, it depletes by half. So what they do to date certain things is they look at what is the ratio of carbon-12, regular carbon, to carbon-14. And that kind of gives them an understanding of how long ago it died because of kind of the ratio of the balance that they look at. So, interestingly enough, with carbon-14 and, and carbon dating, um, you cannot date anything with carbon dating that wasn't once living, okay? Plants and animals, basically the only things you can actually date with carbon-14. We don't find carbon-14 in rocks because they are not eating carbon-14, right? So it does not go intrinsically into rocks, only into plants and animals and humans. So you can't date it if it wasn't once living, okay? That's one you know, stipulation. The other stipulation is carbon-14, with that half-life being relatively short of 5,730 years, that means after about 70,000 years, you're basically out of any sort of readable carbon-14. You won't be able to date it and test it as a sample. So when it comes to carbon-14 dating, they typically only usually use it for things that were once living, and to fairly recently, within a few thousand years, they would say. After that, it begins to be fairly um, inaccurate. So, oftentimes, they were not going to use carbon-14 dating or radiocarbon dating for things like dinosaurs because the natural assumption is that dinosaurs are millions and millions of years old, you know, millions of years extinct. You know, 65 million years ago, <coughs> we should not find carbon-14 in dinosaurs. So they typically, as a regular standard of practice, don't even try to date dinosaur bones with carbon-14 dating because they naturally assume that they are not going to contain any of that. Well, guess what? It has been dated many times. They've actually sent dinosaur bones off to the laboratories and they come back with a pretty good amount of carbon-14 left. 
The same is true with diamonds that are supposedly two to three billion years old. And a diamond is a very strong you know, mineral, the strongest mineral, has a very strong lattice. So in other words, you shouldn't expect to have any sort of contamination going into that diamond, you know, outside contamination from carbon-14. It should be whatever is intrinsically found within that diamond. So the fact that we find carbon-14 in dinosaur bones and in diamonds gives us an indication these things can't be millions and millions of years old because no readable amounts of carbon-14 should be found within them at all. We find pretty good amounts within both dinosaur bones and within diamonds. I thought for rocks, you can't, you can't find carbon in it. Rocks do not. Right. Oh, diamond is a mineral. Diamond starts off as carbon, which was once, uh, ha, yep. Ha, ha, ha. So interesting, interestingly enough, we find carbon-14 in it. So pretty interesting. So it shows us that they can't possibly be those millions and millions of years old. <laughs> um, but oftentimes, the general public doesn't realize how carbon-14 works as far as half-life, and it was once living in, in fact, Hollywood oftentimes doesn't realize that either. Um, because it's oftentimes misused in Hollywood and movies. Anybody ever seen the movie, the Transformers movie? Mm -hmm. And that's oh, been a while since it first came out. When that movie came out, um, in that movie they find a stone cube that comes from space and lands on the Earth. And in the movie they say, we carbon dated this cube to being 10 million years old. <laughs> <laughs> well, wait a minute. Every geologist or scientist in that room should say, ah, because that's really bad science. Mm -hmm. Because First of all, it's stone, so you can't carbon date something that's stone. Second of all, 10 million years old, you can't date anything in that range at all with carbon-14. It's not possible. So every scientist or geologist in the room would say, oh, there's bad science, but everybody else watching the movie says, ooh, science. <laughs> that sounds good to me, right? And they naturally assume that scientists have done their work and their research and it makes sense to them. And you hear that oftentimes in media, so it becomes what you hear, and that's you know, what we tend to refer to as propaganda. Mm -hmm. And you're hearing a mistruth, but you're hearing it enough times it makes sense and sounds like it's right. The same is true for park signs you're going to see in the national park. For example, you go to the rim, and you might see signs up there that show you all the rock layers of the Grand Canyon. And they say, well, this layer is 230 million years old. This layer down here is 550 million years old. Guess what? There is actually no scientific study or test by which you can directly date a sedimentary rock layer. It doesn't exist. Those ages, those dates you see on there are actually arbitrarily assigned by somebody who kind of calculated, well, based upon today's present rates of processes of uniformitarianism, how old are these rock layers based upon those assumptions? And those assumptions become studied and become fact and become added to books and become put on park science. If you were to ask anybody, any ranger in there, well, how did they date the sedimentary rocks? Well, they kind of calculated and they figured it out because of the fossils they find within there and the fossils they find within there, they find those fossils and other layers, so they kind of date the rocks by the fossils and the fossils by the rocks and kind of a circular reasoning sort of idea, which you can see some of that in the book that we have. But really, people look at that science, oh, well, they naturally assume they must have dated these rocks, right? They naturally have you know, conclusively proven that these rocks are 550 million years old. There's some kind of study and, and scientific test for that, right? No, not at all. So the whole idea of carbon dating, for example, like you mentioned, carbon dating, um, is often misused by those who don't know how to use it. And it's never actually, you cannot date anything, and they don't date with carbon-14 in the millions of years at all. It is somewhat useful to dating things of people and civilizations that we have in the past up to a certain extent. We can actually get a fairly accurate date, and there's, there's some good science behind some of that. Um, but you're never going to hear carbon-14 used in the scientific realm in the millions of years process, even though it makes sense. And people naturally say, well, well they must have carbon dated the rocks, right? That's how they get the age for 550 million years old. No, and scientists will admit that. That's not how they date those rocks at all. But the general public doesn't realize that. So they hear about things like carbon-14 dating, and they naturally assume, well, that's what they use to date all these rocks in the millions of years range. And they just are kind of hush-hush about how it's actually done, because it's not a direct scientific dating test that they've actually used to come up with that. So that's carbon dating in a nutshell. You know, it's a